I'll be glorified and let the church be edified. Right, and let the devil be terrified. All right, all, right, all the way from Alabama, let's make welcome to you. Let's go to hand clap of praise in this house. Amen. Well, Brother Bell took me to Coles today and bought me a brand new pair of shoes. I'm going to preach tonight like I robbed the bank. Got <laughs> <laughs> so happy to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Dude, I got a word to preach tonight. Come on. Right now. I'm excited tonight. I'm excited. I love that song, Veronica. That's a Clint Brown. I heard Clint Brown do that years ago. Uh, and uh, just worked that thing really good. I'm going to sing one by him as well. I went into my studio there at my home uh, sometime back. And uh, just begin to think about how far God had brought me over the years from drugs and alcohol and perversion and just the journey that we took together for 30 years of ministry. And, and uh, so many times he saved my life when I was just being stupid. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to do something stupid. We've all done stupid things, but some of us get stuck on stupid. All right. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, I know I'm not the only one. I don't know if y'all agree with me or laughing at me. Come on, amen. Yeah. But I, I've just got a tendency at times to get stuck on stupid. And I just went in the studio, man, and I just began to just think about the goodness of the Lord. And um, these these words just came to my heart. And I hope they bless you tonight, amen. Just let it be a sweet bomb of Gilead in a wound. Where would I be? You only know I'm glad you see Through eyes of love A hopeless case An empty place If not for grace Where would I Thank God. 
letting him take all the time he needs tonight. That's where the rest of you is going to be in a few minutes. God's an awesome God, man. So many years of his life has been dry. The Bible talks about a dry place. And uh, he and I have exchanged many text messages as he travels up and down the road in that semi-truck. And uh, I believe he's due a breakthrough. I said he's due a breakthrough. Amen. And I uh, pray he finds that amen before this week is over. But tonight will be his last night in revival. He's the road again tomorrow. So he tell me prayer when he pray, amen. And God will just minister to him. It's a lonely place out there. Very lonely. I want to remind you before I get into the word tonight, several of you already began to hit me up about the revival CDs. This is the list, Lord, to be laying right outside the door. I'll be standing by when you go out tonight. Um, you pretty much, everybody picks up their CDs every year, except there's just a few people. They get excited in the meeting. They sign the list, and they don't show up. Um, if you don't show up, hey, man, I'll give you CDs away to someone else. Uh, I didn't burn these off for me to listen to them. Come on, amen. amen. I can't stand to hear me preach. It's just a, it's just a preacher thing. Amen. We listen to anybody else except amen. ourselves. And, um, and so this is for any size love offering donation of your choice. My airfare was close to $500. And so every year I do these CDs to try to cover that expense. The church that takes very good care of me. Every year the church does. Um, so if you want to, the CDs from Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, I won't be able to burn Thursday nights off, but I'll leave the master CD here. Uh, you just sign this list. Please come back. Be responsible enough if you sign it to pick them up. Um, if not, make arrangements with me to leave Amen. them with someone, Amen. and then I'll leave them with someone. You can drop out another time and pick them up. Again, they're for any size of love offer, donation of your choice. I don't charge a dime for these. And you're welcome to have them free as long as I don't catch you lighting up a marble all day, man, when church is over. Amen. Because the way I see it is if you can afford to kill your flesh, you can afford to feed my family. Come on, amen. amen. Hello. Amen. Yeah, fair enough? Yeah. Fair enough. So it'll be laying right out there on the, in the foyer when we leave tonight. Amen. Uh, it is so good, amen, to have my buddy with me. Amen, brother Eric. I wasn't expecting him until tomorrow night, but uh, sometimes, amen, he tries to pull a few on me. And uh, I was over there engrossed in them drums, amen, playing. I saw the light, looked up. I didn't just see the light. I saw Eric. Come on, amen. <laughs> Good to have his buddy with me as well, brother. Forgive me for getting your name. I know it's on the tip of my tongue, but you guys are really involved together in ministry, and it's been really refreshing. Eric's ministry is really taking off, and God's using him in a, in a powerful way. And, uh, uh, boy, he showed up on the right night tonight. This word, I'm going to tell you right now, I'll just entitle this Eric King. Amen. <laughs> And uh, I thought, wow, all night for him to show up. He shows up tonight. But I'm sure the rest of us will benefit from this as well. Amen. Amen. It is so good to see each one of you tonight in the house of Sister Carol Brain is with us tonight. Amen. And her kickstand and travels with her everywhere she goes. I'm glad they're here tonight. Amen. Each one of you took the time to be here. Uh, good to have Brother Walls with us. Amen. He's been yeah. sick. Amen. And uh, he's with me tonight. He said, brother, if i got to get up and walk out, it's because I'm coughing. Well, don't want to disrupt. Brother Walsh, you can go sit in the stalls to hear the preaching in this church. Come on, amen. <laughs> we got speakers in the bathroom. <laughs> 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 well, the only church I've ever been to where I enjoy sitting on the toilet. Come on, amen. <laughs> <laughs> brother Bell didn't think that's funny. Moving on, amen. Wonderful tonight, amen, to be in the house of the Lord. We didn't get the drinkless back, but we got three of them anyhow. Come on, amen. We got Shadrach, Meshach, where's the four? Okay. And she's white. Come on, amen. I'm talking about that girl. Come on. She got some soul? Yeah. All right, then. That's all I need. Yeah. They say it about skin color. I said, I beg your pardon. I'd rather preach in a black church than any white church in the end of the week. They sang for three hours. They show up to get in. We show up to leave. <laughs> Their funerals are awesome. Amen. They are awesome. They celebrate lives. Yeah. We grieve death. Yeah. 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 A lot of difference between white folk and black folk. Yeah. Good to have them back with us tonight. We enjoy the first yeah. 
chapter number 24. If you want to stand, I would ask you to do that tonight. I'm going to read quite a bit, but these verses are very quick verses. They're not long. And I did try to figure out how I could break this down into a segment to keep from reading so much. But sometimes, I'm not taking anything from the Word of God, but the way people's perceptions are, if you read a whole lot of text, they seem to get lost in the passage, and you've got to play catch up for the first 20 minutes of your message, trying to get everybody gathered back in. But this is a really cool story. Amen. And uh, I, I, I really think there's a lot of nuggets in this tonight that I'm going to have to unpack. There's so much revelation, so much meat, so much. Tonight. Matter of fact, I did this before at Montville before. How many of you remember what to do when I say nugget time? Oh, you remember that, don't you? Get your hand up. When I say nugget time, I'm going to throw a nugget at you. You've got to catch it. Amen. So you preachers in this house, I'm about to drive you stupid tonight, amen, with nuggets. I'm going to give you a 16 series in one message tonight. There's so much revelation and nuggets in this thing, it's pitiful. Amen. I'm going to pick this with a toothpick. We, it reminded me when I was preparing this, we, I stopped at the men's conference when I got off the plane. Um, was it Friday, Saturday? Saturday's when I flew in, right? Yeah. Flew in Saturday. Uh, so they, uh, Brother Dale came by and picked me up, took me up to the men's conference, and, and they, man, they had food everywhere. I mean, there's so much food. We had one guy drop by, and he ate three bowls of beans. He ate a ribeye. He ate one of those big porter houses about that big on his plate. He, uh, he, he, had, uh, he had two baked potatoes. Uh, I don't know how many soft drinks he drank. And, uh, we, I thought about just giving an award away tonight for taking advantage of something you didn't pay for. Let's put our hands together for Brother Andy Peters. Amen. Uh, Andy knows how to take advantage of a situation he didn't pay for. Go on, Amen. Hello. <laughs> Andy ate about a seventy-eight dollar meal. Amen. Just for lunch. <laughs> And they weren't no food. <laughs> I told you, Dale, I'd get him, didn't I, brother? <laughs> oh, Andy thought he died at the moment. Come on, amen. All right, Luke 24, let's have fun tonight. Verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. They walked together of all these things. They talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass... And while they communed together reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Check this out. But their eyes were holed or blind that they could not know him. They weren't physically blind, but it was, they, they, they couldn't tell it was him. He was camouflaged, if you will. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another? What are you guys talking about as you walk? Why are you so sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, Answer said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And Jesus said unto them, What things? He's playing games with them. Huh? He's playing games. What things? What, what, what are you talking about? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests that our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death have crucified him. We trusted that he had been with thee, which should have redeemed Israel. Beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which, which were early in the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came running to say that he had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even as the women had said. And him they saw not. Then Jesus said unto them, O fools, are slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, man. Come on, chill out with us. For it's toward evening, and, and the day's far spent. And, and, and he went to tarry on with them. And he came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. And their eyes were open. Just a few more verses. And they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Amen. What a day, man. Check this out. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn with us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures? Did we have a clue it was even him, man? What an amazing trip coming in. And they rose up the same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and, and hath appeared to Simon. Last verse. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known to them in breaking of bread. Amen. Let's go to work tonight. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you a little while tonight about trusting God's timing. Amen. Trusting Amen. God's timing. You say if you move too quickly, you uh -huh. come floating in on broken pieces. All right now. Yeah. Ask the Apostle Paul. And if you move too slowly, God will replace you with someone else in a little quicker old man. Amen. Purpose and timing goes together with God. You cannot separate the two. All right now. Everything about God's agenda for your life has to do with His timing and His purpose, yeah. not yours. Yeah. This can be complicated because we like everything microwave. Right we want microwave revival. Maybe. We wait till we get here to even focus on God. We want it over in 25 minutes, amen, leaving okay. with a weekend buzz. Come on, hello, amen. But God doesn't work on our timetable. He doesn't work according to our own purpose. Let's go to work tonight. In this text, Brother Bell, it is wise to understand right out of the gate that Jesus, Andy, is in the intermediate stage. He's already risen from the dead, but check this out. He has not yet ascended to the Father. Did you catch that? Don't just nod your head at me. You've got to catch that. Amen. He's already rose from the dead. He's out of the tomb. They went to the tomb. His body isn't there. So he's in that intermediate stage between the tomb and and ascension to the Father. Right. So in the meantime, before he ascends to the Father, he's just taking a stroll through the community. He's doing house calls. Amen. He's not healing any more blind people. He's not raising any dead. All right now. He's not turning any more water to wine. He's not opening any more deaf ears. He's in that intermediate stage. Yes, he has stopped the miracles that everybody has become accustomed to seeing. He's no longer using miracles to convince the unconvincible. He's only showing himself alive to his own. Amen. He's only showing himself alive to his own. Amen. The only ones he appeared to, right. the only house he visited, the only people he sat down to eat with, All right now. All right. was his own. Right. I come to that just wondering, is there anybody in this house who claims to be his own? Are you here tonight? Right. Is there anybody in this place that knows they belong to him and he to them? Yes. Are you his own tonight? Yes. Because if you are, then I can assure you, no matter what your deliver situation in life, God's about to show himself alive to you. Come on, yes. Yes. Don't give up, just yet. Yes. He'll show himself alive to you. Yes. Don't throw in the towel on that marriage. Just give it some time. He'll show himself alive to you. Yes. Don't just walk off from the job and quit tomorrow. Get a little longer, amen, to show himself alive to you. Come on. Don't cave in to defeat and misery. Don't listen to the devil that tells you that you're finished and there's no hope. If you belong to him and he to you, he will show himself alive to you. Someone in the room tonight, I'm not going into the details. It's their story to tell and not mine. We've got a bit of a negative report today from the doctor, amen. Left them insecure, a bit nervous, and it would any of us, amen, because of the apprehension and the fear of the unknown. Yeah. It's not it's not to that level of chemo and all this other stuff and surgery. And it's not on that level at all, amen. Yeah. But I want to say to that individual staring at me right now, you just hold your ground right now. Yeah. Just hold it steady, yeah. honey. Because the truth is, he's going to show himself alive to you. Come on, amen. I can't say it from the light outside the building, but those in this house tonight belong to him. They're their life and journey to him. It's a setup. He's going to show himself alive.
supply of the yes. Yes. What you have to do in seasons of conflict and adversity is you got to listen for God to show you things that other people don't see. All right now. Mm -hmm. All right now. And you ain't man in me, but that complicates it. Because we want everybody to agree with us. Yeah. Makes it easy to pull the trigger then. The truth is, amen, if you are his, he'll show, himself, show you things, tell you things, and reveal you certain things that other people don't see. Yes. He'll show himself alive to you. Yes. And the beautiful thing about moments like this is that you don't need other people's confirmation. All right, because now. God's already spoken to you. Amen. You don't need their approval, their All disapproval, right. or even their input or advice when God speaks to you. Right. When God shows himself alive to you, yes. that's all you need to go on. Right. Period. Amen. Period. Yes. If he has revealed himself to you yes. and shown himself to you, yes. then don't risk your blessing by seeking confirmation for someone God's not spoken to about you Amen. or that particular situation. Perfect illustration of that is when I was called into full-time evangelism. And you got to understand something. With me, it was very quick. I got saved October the 16th, 1994. Let's see, April the 2nd of 1995, I surrendered my call to preach. So that's October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Six months after I got saved, I surrendered my call to preach. And then four months after that, I went into full-time evangelism. And, and it just took off, man. I mean, my ministry just exploded and just took off. So it wasn't even a year, almost a year to the day, man. It was, it was less than a year. I then got saved and went in full-time ministry. Amen. And you know how many people doubted me? You know how many people tried to talk me out of this? Right. At that particular time, I was a welder. I welded for Bell South, uh, the phone company back at that time. Big steel reels. And I was on the assembly line. And I was a very good welder. I made very good money doing so. And, and I was welding one day, and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I want you to pull your welding helmet, off. welding helmet off. I want you to lay your stinger down. I want you to go over there and clock out, get your Bible, go to the street corner, be Amen. there by 2 o'clock this evening, open up your Bible, and preach my word. Amen. All right, now. It's a trip anyhow. And as Jim Carrey would say, all ready then. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fun, right? So I sit back, took my welding helmet off, pissed it down on the ground, dropped my stinger, amen, looked over my supervisor, and I said, I'm done. He said, what do you mean you're done? I said, brother, I said, God just spoke to me that he meant to preach his word. He said, well, you can preach when you get done with that reel right there. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you're not the one to save me. You're not the one to deliver me. You're not the one All to right call me. Right. I said, you're walk away for $32 an hour job due for a raise here very, very soon with all these benefits. I said, there's no greater benefit, amen, than serving, amen, the most right high. I said, yes, I'm just going to obey the Lord. I said, I love you. Thank you for the job you've given me. I said, but uh, I'm going to obey the Lord. Yes, God. He said, well, it ain't even right what you're doing. I said, why is it? He said, because you're supposed to honor your employer. I said, the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than man. I didn't create this problem. All right, now. God did. He amen. said, what are you going to do for money? I said, if it's God's will, it's God's will. Woo, He'll right. take care of me. I got up, walked over there, I clocked out, yes. I got in my truck, went to the house, took a shower, put my clothes on, grabbed my old Bible right here. Boy, it's been with me a long time, hadn't it, guys? I got one of those convertible bottles. Amen. Right. Comes out. Yeah. <laughs> amen. amen. And, and don't, don't go buy me one, amen, because I'm not going to use it with you. Amen. A Bible torn parts is a good sign of a life that's not. Come on, amen. Hello, anyway. Right We've been on a journey for 30 years together. And I remember grabbing that old Bible, went out to the street corner, started preaching the gospel out there on the street. And it wasn't 15 minutes, here come a police officer telling me to get off the street. I thought, I said, well, I would, but it wasn't my idea. He said, well, whose idea was it? I said, well, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew. Amen. I'll tell you exactly whose idea it was. I started telling him the Bible says go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be filled. He said, I didn't ask for a preacher's message. He said, I'm simply asking you to leave the street. I said, I can't leave the street till God's through with me. He said, well, if I come back, you're going to jail. I said, I've paid taxes, amen, for 20 plus years. I deserve three hots and a cot. Come on, amen. <laughs> amen. So it wasn't very long, amen. I was in the back seat of the board. <laughs> headed to my new house. Got to the jail, amen, took me in there, put me in 18 cell, man, man cell bay, amen. The only man in there was another brother, amen. It was a black guy, amen, a lot bigger than I was. Big old white eyes, amen, looked me up and down, amen. I nicknamed him Bubba. If you ever jail cells got a Bubba, that's the one who's bigger than you and thinks you smell good. Come on, amen. Hello. Amen. Now I'm wishing I hadn't took a shower and got ready. Come on, amen. Hello. <laughs> Ain't nobody ever been in Bubba. He said, what you in here for? 
I said, then what? He said, what you in here for? I said, well, I'm here for preaching the gospel. He said, what's the gospel? I said, you got your Bible? You can turn right here. <laughs> and I went to let him have it. A few minutes later, amen, there come the jailer around there and said, I'm not going to listen to this nonsense. He said, I didn't sent you in here to have church. He said, I sent you in here to regret what you've done. I saw when they took me out. They may took Bob out, took him down the hallway, locked him up in a jail down the hall, heard the jail cell door slam. Amen. All of a sudden, I got to looking around. I'm in there by myself. I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to do? Amen. God, I trusted your timing. I, I, I mean, your purpose. I, I walked off from my job. I, I'm doing everything you told me to do. I'm well studied. I've been fasting. I've been praying. I know that was your voice that spoke to me. God, what in the world? Now, I grabbed a hold of the bars. He was just dumb enough at that time to believe that if he done it to Paul and Silas, I said, good for Daniel Couch. So I started singing Amazing Grace as loud as I could at the top of my lungs. Amen. And all of a sudden, they made the jailer come out and told me to shut up. I told him, I'm not singing to you. Come on. Amen. I said, you better let me out of this jail cell. He said, what you going to do about it? I said, well, I'm not going to do anything about it. But there's one coming after me who's mightier than I. Amen. And I wasn't talking about Jesus. I was talking about Mama. Come on. Amen. Hello. And all of a sudden, they locked little Bob up down the hall there, and it wasn't but a few minutes, and I knew, I knew, I knew Bob had been raised by Grandma at a brush yard or a camp meeting or a revival somewhere. All of a sudden, they met, I heard him start singing with me down the hall, and I knew it was him, because white folk can't sing like black folk. Come on, amen. And I could hear old Bob down the hall, old Bob started going, oh, He said, somebody's here to get you. I said, I told you. One after me and mother was coming after me. I was like a sea mama's head on top of her hair. PhD, Pentecostal hair, dude. That thing just to give it that. Come on, amen. All of a sudden, walking across the parking lot. I said, mama, you mad at me for going to jail for preaching? She said, no, baby. The last time I got you out was for crack rock. Now I'm getting you out for the solid rock. Come on, amen. I'm talking about trusting God's timing and his purpose. This church has heard that story before, but I want to tie that in to how I ended up where I am today. About six weeks after that, I was at a pastor's conference. There was some 3,000 pastors at this conference. I was a nobody. Nobody knew me. Uh, I'd been all over TV uh, in North Alabama because they'd done big articles, Bibles or bikinis. Street preacher arrested. Uh, I was in the Bible Belt. I called Jay Seculo for American Center for Law and Justice. He came in town, represented me, shut the whole city down, free of charge because I was a full-time minister, 700 Club, Jay Seculo, one of Donald Trump's attorneys. I'm talking about the powerful guy. Come in and shut him down uh, for, for violating my constitutional right. Because the argument was, the reason I wrote articles, Bibles or bikinis, they said I was too animated while I was preaching. In other words, I didn't just stand out there with a the Bible and go, Tell that to everybody crazy. Come on, amen. I danced around, amen. Walk up to cars, shaking my Bible out of it. I got on the media strip, that little grass strip right there. And I thought it was acceptable because that's where girls in two piece bikinis hold car wash signs. All right now. All right now. Who's going to cause a wreck quicker? Me? Preaching the gospel in a three piece suit? Or a tight tail, amen, and a two piece bikini holding a car wash sign? All right now. Okay. Maybe y'all never seen that in Michigan, amen. But in Alabama. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going there. I'm going to get in trouble right there. I'm going to go back to my post. They hold car wash signs. They hold vote for me signs. They hold I'll work for food signs. So I stepped up there and took my sign. Yeah, took me to jail. It was in this pastor's conference. Somebody in that pastor's conference had noticed me across the room as being on TV for being arrested in the Bible about for preaching the gospel. I'm going somewhere with this. They went to the main speaker of that conference and said, we got a young man in here. He said he was just locked up and put in jail down there in Clarksville, Alabama. They're standing on the street preaching. He said, it's been a pretty big ordeal. He said, why don't you give him a few minutes to share his story? So I'm sitting there, me and my wife, we were sitting there. Guy gets up in the pulpit, 3,000 pounds. He said, we got a young man just starting out in ministry here. And I thought, wow, we're not the only ones. That's cool. About the meeting. <laughs> you know. He said, he also got arrested for preaching the gospel. I went to the window and said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Dude, I really got to meet this guy now. He's got arrested for preaching the gospel. I didn't think nobody. 
Matter of fact, amen, it's been all over the television. Are you? She looks at me, she said, I think somebody knows you. And in 3,000 3, pastors, they brought me up and gave me 15 minutes in front of 3,000 pastors to share my story, my testimony of coming out of drugs and alcohol, to street preaching, to getting arrested, to the whole, to Jay Sekulow coming in, shutting it all down, and all of that. And from that, kicked out 18 revivals from Michigan, to Florida, to Carolinas, to Texas. I was slammed for months because I trusted God's purpose. And I trusted God's time. Yes, when I walked off that job that day, Daddy didn't agree with it. Mama didn't like it. My boss was ticked off. And most everybody doubted me. But I knew God had revealed himself alive to me. And for me, there was no turning back. And I didn't seek anybody's affirmation as to what I knew God had spoken for me to do. There are some things about when God speaks to you. There's something about when God reveals himself to you. Even with Noah, I preached on last night. After God revealed himself to Noah and spoke his will to Noah, Noah didn't need anybody's confirmation or affirmation as to what he should do next. He simply went to work on God's plan. He didn't sit around and procrastinate. He didn't sit around and worry what others might say. He didn't sit around and reflect any concern in anybody's opinion of what he was called by God to do. But there is the mindset that I try to stay in right there. Right. It's not allow people's opinions of me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. To dictate to me whether I'm effective or worthless. Yeah. Right. In Genesis 4 it says, For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Thus saith the Lord. Yeah. For 40 days and 40 nights, Noah and his family lived in the confines of the ark for exactly 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, God brought them out of the ark. Right. Now listen to me. There's something about 40 days that we need to pay attention to tonight. Nugget time. 40 days has a lot of symbolism in Scripture of which we must pay attention to yeah. and understand tonight. The fact that the number 40 appears, and I count it, 145 times in the Bible. Actually, I Googled it. <laughs> 145 times you find the number 40 in the Bible, which underscores the significance of it in the Bible. Genesis 7, 7, and the flood was 40 days up on the earth, and the waters increased. Somebody say rose high. Rose the high. waters increased. Yes. They say rose high. Yes. And bear up the ark. Yes. And it was lifted up above the earth. The waters rose Noah and his family high above what everybody else was drowning in. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. I said it rose him above what everybody else was dying in. Right. It pays to be led by the Spirit of God and not your emotions or the opinions of those around you. Because Noah trusted God's direction for his life. He was elevated above what everybody else was drowning in. My God, church, did you hear what I just said? Don't tell me it doesn't pay to draw an eye to God. Don't you tell me it doesn't pay to learn his voice. Don't you tell me it doesn't pay to heed his counsel or even spontaneous obedience. Don't tell me, amen, you'll never convince me. They mean that it doesn't pay to invest time in his presence. Turn your cell phone off. Turn the television off. Turn all the noise off. Shut up and get in the quiet place and let him talk. It's the difference between life and death. Slap your neighbor and tell them this is my year. I'm going to rise above what others are drowning in. Come on, they might tell your neighbor that. This is my year to rise above what everybody else is dying in. Oh, come on somebody. Who am I talking to in this house tonight? So the Bible tells us concerning another man of God named Elijah that God sent the ravens to feed him. And the Bible says they fed him while he was under the juniper tree. And it tells us he went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. Isn't that amazing? 40 days, Brother Bell, and 40 nights. Amen. Moses went up on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Noah was in the ark 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah goes in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. We keep seeing it in Scripture over and over and over over again, 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus is even in the 40 day window. If you let's go forward, you'll find that. And Jesus returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, being tempted by the devil and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were 
into Jesus was hungry. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. And the Bible says in Mark 1.13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast. Somebody shout wild animals. Somebody shout, and the angels. Say it again, wild animals and angels. Let me read the verse to you. Tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered unto him. Oh, here we go. Look at the oxymoron between the wild animals and the angels of God. Has anybody in this house ever had to live in between wild animals and the angels of God? All right now. All right. So you're there right now. They're somewhere between wild animals who are waiting to devour you, waiting on you to die. They know you haven't eaten 40 days. You're in a season of weakness and vulnerability, needing help, needing strength, needing faith lift. Ladies, I didn't say a face lift. I said you need a faith lift. Come on, amen. Amen, you need a faith lift. And they see you as dinner. And yet at the same time, the angels of God see you as property. All right, now. I don't know about anybody else, but I can sure relate to this analogy very well. 30 years of preaching like I preach, Every day of my life, I'm between the angels yes. and the wild animals. Yes. Amen. Meaning, in any minute, it can go either way. Yes. I've been there, my friend, many times, having to wake up every day living between wild animals and the angels of God. You've been there, Brother Luke? And, yet, and, then, yeah, and then this is where most of, 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 of our lives are on a daily basis. And, and the key to this is making up your mind which one you're going to pay attention to. Are you going to keep on giving all your attention to wild animals snarling and growling and howling at you constantly, keeping your life on edge, sleepless nights, foggy days, without clarity and confidence? Amen. Snarling wild animals curled up in the corner saying to you every day of your life, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. You're going to collapse. Somebody will assassinate you. Your wife's going to leave you. That church won't have you back. You're going to go broke. Amen. You ain't got no monthly support. What you going to do for money? You're going under now. You ain't made. You're going to destroy you. Things will never get any better. You're going to die in defeat. Are you going to look to the angels of God that's been sent to minister to you? What I love about angels is that angels don't need a perfect audience to bring about an exceptional end. From Michael, the archangel, his primary role biblically is to fight and conquer. He's a warrior. He was created a war on each of our behalves. I'm thankful for this revelation tonight, Brother Bell, because it tells me that the angels of God can minister to you and I right in the middle of the presence of wild animals, the enemy of God, and we still end up getting our blessing, our miracle, amen, our need made with total abundance because we don't belong to the devil, we belong to God, amen, as a roaring lion. As a roaring lion. I think we often show a lack of spiritual maturity in church these days. I think we also show a lack of faith by asking God to remove the wild animals. All right now. The things that torment us and torture us, bother us, and antagonize us. Uh, we want him to remove the wild animals. Let's get rid of it all. In fact, God is never afraid of the wild animals. Amen. He don't want you to be either. Right. That's why you get under the wing of the Almighty. Amen. He even goes as far as to prepare a table for you and I, right slap down in the presence of the wild animals, yes. our enemies. Yes, Lord. So stop begging God to drive away all of your problems because they are the more there for no other reason than to watch you eat and be ministered to. Yes, you didn't catch that, but I did. Who am I talking to this evening? God allowed your enemies to stay alive, not to torment you, but to watch you eat. So he could prove an irrevocable point in your life, and that is this. None of the snarling of their teeth or the intimidation of their growl could stop you from being ministered to by God. Amen. God wants to show every one of us at Montville Community Church who he is. So that the next time something snarls and growls at you, you won't run from it, cave into defeat and despair, and leave the church and blame everybody else for a cage of your own creation. And blame everybody else for their misery. I hope they watch a live stream. It's truth, guys. I'm thankful tonight that I serve a God that feeds me in the presence of wild beasts. Because that tells me I don't have to rely on friends and family. 
I don't have to rely on preachers and teachers and prayer partners and TBN and Joel Osteen or Dr. Phil. Come on, amen. When God gets ready to bless you, he'll send the angels to minister to you. He don't matter the situation, the circumstance, or the dreadful outcome. If God be for us, who can be against us? In fact, the Bible tells us, Chris, amen, that angels are ministering spirits. They're ordained of God to minister to you and I in a time of need, Brother Eric. There's some of you sitting here tonight, amen, that should be six foot under, but God sent his angels to deliver you. Somebody in this house was so deep in depression and about to give up, but God sent his angels to minister to you. Others here tonight survived stuff you thought you would never get out of, but God sent his angels to minister to you. King of no one's rescue but you. When angels come, they never come to steal from you. Yes. They come to help you, heal you, yes. and never hurt or burn you. Yes. The angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. Yes. Can I say that again? The angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. Yes. Not those that just go to church and have a Bible in their hand. Not those that even just got a Jesus bumper sticker or a cross on their chain. Now going to church doesn't make you a Christian. No more than going to an Alabama chicken house and make you a hen. Come on, amen. Hello. Amen. amen. You've got to have a relationship with Jesus. Amen. You may not realize it tonight, but you're surrounded by the angels amen. of God right now. This very minute, the second I'm preaching to you. I say, you're right now, you're surrounded. Somebody scream. I'm surrounded by angels. Say, come on. Tell cancer, I'm surrounded by angels. Tell sickness and disease, I'm surrounded by angels. Tell discouragement and depression, I'm surrounded by angels. Tell fear and unbelief, I'm surrounded by angels. Even if you live all by yourself, I'm still surrounded by angels. Four more years of Joe Biden, I'm still surrounded by the angels of God. The angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. That means they set up their account around those in this house that fear God. That's why I'm a praiser. That's why I get loud and get excited. Amen. Because I reverence God. The fear of God is to reverence God. And when you start reverencing God, amen, honoring God, being obedient to God, addicted to God, loving God, craving God, the angels move their headquarters to your local estate so they can protect you and fight on your behalf. Any wild animal that tries to take you out. Did you know you're surrounded by angels? You're surrounded. You know what that means? You're enclosed. You're fenced in. You're enveloped. You're encircled. You're surrounded by the angels of God Almighty. I didn't even come to preach on angels, but I'm having fun doing it. Come on, amen. Hello. I didn't know I knew so much about them. Come on, amen. Hello. <laughs> hey, listen to this. The Bible says in Acts 1 3, Jesus presented himself alive unto his disciples after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being sent of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He stayed around for 40 days. He just hung around and just hung out with the boys. 40 days. Between coming out of the tomb and waiting for the ascension of the Father, it lasted 40 days. Just running around, Russ, just hanging out with the guys. They didn't have a clue who he was. They looked right at him, man. Be Jesus Christ. They thought it was Russ Calhoun. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? He, he's just playing mind games with them. Jesus just crashing parties, walking through doors, showed up in the upper room, uninvited, hanging out on the road to Emmaus, just people watching. We got any people watchers in here? Amen. Amen. Dude, just drop me off at the mall and I'm happy to do time in the chair. <laughs> These girls come walking by, man, I'm thinking to myself, honey, just because they make it, I mean, you need to wear it. <laughs> I shouldn't Amen. say that. <laughs> but I already have, so let's move on. <laughs> I just watch people. People are so funny to me. Like I'm the only one that's got it together. Everybody else has got problems. Everybody else is flawed. Except me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. My daddy does that. Just watch his people. When they tell me all the time, quit staring. Say, honey, did you see the nose on that guy? 
I can't count my front loops, honey. Can you imagine? I mean, when his nose gets there, it takes him 20 minutes for him to show up. After, I mean, I'll be riding down the road, and I get distracted because somebody's got big, 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 bigger ears than I do. I was always mocked in school. I was always so blooming skinny in school if my back was or my belly would peel. You know? Now I put on some weight, so I'm going to mock them. Come on. Hello, amen! I'm just playing. The truth is, I just love to watch people. I think people are funny. Everybody has their own appetites, their own ways of doing things, their own way of dressing. And, you know, it'd be 90 degrees in Alabama, hey, man. This dude comes walking down the sidewalk the other day with a toboggan on. I was in Walmart last week, and this guy comes walking by me there, and he's got his buggy, and he's leaned over on his buggy. He's pushing his buggy with his butt stuck out. I mean, he's pushing his buggy, but he's got his pants hanging down, and his belt's going around the bottom of his crotch. His britches are hanging way down here, and I couldn't help myself. I got in behind him. I had to do it. I said, hey, brother. What's up? I said, what's the belt for? <laughs> That's all I said. That's all I said. That's all I had to say. All I did, I said, hey, what's, what's, I'm real serious, Russ. I said, what's, what's, what's the belt for? <laughs> I'm acting like an idiot. What, what's the belt for? <laughs> Put him in. He said, I feel you, dog. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Ain't nothing else needs to be said. You're right. You're right, dog. I just started smiling. We just fist bump one another. He said, I hear you. You got it. Put his pants up, kept on pushing his mug. All I said was, what's the belt for? Come on, hello, amen. I, I just, I just love messing with people. I mean, ask us a good question. What is the belt for? I thought it was to hold your britches up. Maybe I missed something. I don't know. Last time I went to Walmart, I bought a free pack of uh, underwear. I've never bought any outerwear. <laughs> well, we find those. They're called underwear because they go under your britches and the, the belt. Okay, me moving on. Hey, Amen. Just watching people on the road in the mess, waiting for the right time to converse with people, just hanging out with boys. Which brings us to our opening text. Jesus has been hanging around just to interview. When you look at your Bible, you'll find the only thing he did in 40 days by hanging around, he just kept intervening. 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 Nobody was asking for him. He's still trying to figure out where in the world he went. And, 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 and trying to figure this out. It's a puzzle to them. He just keeps showing up. He just keeps intervening. When he's least expecting it, he shows up, shows out, shows himself alive to his own. Russ, he intervenes in the upper room with Thomas because Thomas is down in the Lord's presence. He's not sure Jesus is even who he says he is. He, he, but because Jesus didn't do what Thomas thought he should do. Well, you better listen to me because I'm pissing to bust somebody right now. Now Thomas is offended and ticked off, doubting, upset, full of frustration and unbelief because Jesus didn't do what Thomas thought he would do. I want to talk to some disappointed Christians in this room right now. You better listen to me. Some of you mamas are ticked off and disappointed because it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out the way you thought it should turn out. Some of you daddies are upset. Some of you kids are upset. Some of you parents are upset. I guarantee you Brother Bell's upset with some of you. Come on, because it didn't turn out the way he thought it should have turned out, even as an evangelist, amen. There are times, amen, the revival doesn't turn out the way I thought it should have turned out. I thought the house should have been packed, amen, because I preached a good word. Hello, amen. I mean, I traveled a long time to get here. Hello. I ain't been a year since y'all seen me. Where's everybody at? I don't crowds this year, but there's times I get upset because it don't work out the way I thought it should have worked out. I got out of the pulpit last night, so excited. They may pulled out my cell phone. If you ever see me on my cell phone, by the way, up here on this platform, I'm pulling up songs and getting the words to them and the chord chart to it because some of these songs I ain't done in a long time. And so I'm up out up here texting. My phone's cut off. I don't communicate with nobody outside the church while I'm in church. When I go out, I turn my phone on, let my wife know I'm good. They may have going home with Pastor. Go back to the room. Hey Amen. I had a great service tonight. Walked out last night. Both my kids were hitting me. Dad called me. Abby texted me. Daddy called me the minute you walk out. I'm thinking, my God, man, what is going on at home? Because this is the price I have to pay for doing what I do. Amen. He can't get to me. So what does he do? He killed my dog last night. Now, it don't mean nothing to you because you still got yours. But, but my daughter backed up last night, ran over Snoopy. 
named him Snoopy because his eyes is like that and he looks like Snoop Dogg. <laughs> <laughs> so we named him Snoopy. He really does. I don't think he's always high. He always like he's high. And, and Snoop Dogg's always high. Pastor Luke don't have a clue who I'm talking about, Snoop Dogg. Amen. <laughs> if I mention Porter Wagner, he knows him, amen. But they don't know. <laughs> Snoop Dogg. Always smoking weed. Right. And, and he's always high. And the dogs always had lazy eyes, both of them. He looks, I said, Snoop. He looked up. My name is Snoop. Well, we got him behind the tire last night. Took a ride to Doggy World. Had to reach under there after she run over him. He's screaming his head off. She reached out there to grab him. He bit into her and broke her finger. Wouldn't let go. So mama's now got to take a dog to the vet, have him put down, and take a daughter to the ER. Thought about having her put down. <laughs> <laughs> it's high maintenance, man. Every time I get a check, it goes to her. I want to have to take care of her son. And, and, and so this was all going on, and I thought, I got off the phone with them, and, and I called Caleb. Thought, all hell broke loose with Caleb. No, Caleb was on cloud nine. He just got out of the academy. He called me going, Dad! I said, son, what's going on? Why are you breathing hard? Oh, Dad, it's been a great day on patrol. Best day I've ever had out here. I said, why, did you shoot somebody? He said, well, kind of. He said, uh, I got the taser guy on the go. He says, looking through people's windows, walking down the highway. I gave him three options. I can take you home, call an ambulance, or take you to jail. Dude was high on meth. He looked at me and said he wasn't feeling any of the options. <laughs> I said, what'd you do? He said, well, then I tried to arrest him, but he was bigger than me. He said, I tried all the maneuvers they taught me in the police academy how to get them under control, but it don't work with meth heads. <laughs> it don't work with them. He said, Dad, I shot him three times with a taser. Finally got him face planted on the asphalt, jumped on top of him, put my knee in his back, handcuffed him, and he cussed me all the way to jail, Dad. It was an awesome day. The son, I know how you feel. In my last revival, I've done three people the same way. Well, amen. <laughs> yeah. I tore them up one side and down another. Amen. Hello. I want to talk to some disappointed Christians tonight. You can't allow yourself to get disappointed because God didn't do what you thought he was going to do. Amen. Right. You better listen to what I'm fixing to tell you because this amens are fixing to be cut out right here in a second. Because this is fixing to be personal. You can't allow yourself to blow a gasket when it appears God failed you and the situation didn't turn out like you wanted it to. Right. Just because God didn't do what you thought he was going to do doesn't mean that the Lord is not with you right. or that the Lord failed you or abandoned you Amen. or even that he refused to answer your petition. Listen to me. They thought that Jesus had come to restore them nationally. All along they thought that's what he was going to do. To get involved with them politically. To get involved in overthrowing the Roman oppression. And he did eventually. But Jesus didn't come to get involved with them politically. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Come on, right? right? Just because God didn't do what you thought he was going to do doesn't mean that God is not doing something great in your life. Amen. Amen. You ain't mad at me now until all hell breaks loose. And we don't see you for six weeks. Amen. Come on. Pastor's got to visit you every day and make sure he calls you, amen, for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Or then you have a reason for not coming back. Well, nobody, nobody really cares. The reality of it is, just because God didn't, listen, get rid of your depression. Because hidden in your depression and discouragement, but hear this, is arrogance. Yes. All right now. Hidden in your depression and your discouragement is arrogance. Because you ordered God around and he didn't follow your orders. Now your feelings are hurt because God didn't follow your orders. Can I remind you that God did not create you so you could order him around. He created you so that he could order you around. It is he that made us and not we ourselves. He is 
the postmaster, I am the mailman. He is the CEO, I am the employee. He's the king of kings, I am the servant. He's the head, I am not. He bought me, I didn't purchase him. Just because you asked for it, you expected it, you envisioned it, you thought it was supposed to turn out a certain way. If God didn't do it, it wasn't supposed to happen that particular way either, or it was not his perfect timing. The Bible says in James 4, 3, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it to your own lust, your own wants and desires. When you pray, you should always pray for God's perfect will, not his permissive will. When you pray, you should pray, I don't want God giving me anything that is not formatted to his perfect will for my life at that particular time. No matter how bad I want it, no matter how wonderful I think it would be, no matter how bad I think I need it, if God didn't do it, it wasn't supposed to happen that particular way, or either it's not his perfect time. So often we forget that God has a perfect plan for our lives, for our children's lives, for our parents, for our friends. If God would have done what you expected him to do, amen, it would have messed up the plan. There are times when God refuses to intervene, no matter how bad you want it, no matter how much sense it would make, or what a blessing you think it might be, no matter how much you pray, no matter the level of faith you have concerning your request. There are still times that God does not intervene even when you think he should. And you can use all the Bible verses you want. You can't manipulate him with his own word. You can manipulate me. And I can manipulate you. you. We didn't write the book. That ain't my word. That's his word. You ain't going to manipulate God. God ain't going to cave into your manipulation. Job, listen, it's like a 14-piece puzzle. The son was trying to get the puzzle to go together. He couldn't get it to go together. So he got frustrated, thought every bit of it in the garbage. The dad walked by a few minutes later and noticed all the pieces of the puzzles in the garbage. And he said, what did you do this for? It's a brand new puzzle. Why'd you throw it in the garbage, son? We just thought this. The son said, I couldn't get it to work. It didn't make any sense. None of the pieces fit. I got frustrated and thrown it away. I'm done with that. Dad said, well, do you mind? I give it a shot. So I said, you can have the thing. I'm through with it. Done Pulled all the pieces out, dumped them on the table. The man threw the garbage can to the side, and a moment's time, boom, 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 boom. There's the puzzle put together. The son said, Dad, how in the world did you do that so quickly? And the dad said, the difference between me and you, son, is you're just looking at the pieces, but your father's looking at the picture. And so often, all we see is the pieces that don't fit, the ones that's missing. We frustrated, we throw it away, we came into discouragement, disappointment, frustration, quit the church. Reality, God was looking at the whole picture. Yes, right. Amen. He was looking at the pieces. Yes. Reality, it is. Job said, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, I cannot proceed. On the left hand, where he doeth work, but I can't behold him. And he hides himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. In other words, I go forward, I go back, left and right. Where in the God's name? And yet, he still went on to say, Though he slay me, yet I'll serve him. Job never got offended, never quit, never walked away because God didn't do it the way Job wanted it to be. You see, it wasn't time for God to overthrow the powers of all. He ultimately did later on. Veronica, they, they thought he had come to do it right now. And when he didn't do what they thought he should do, when it was they thought he should get it done, Thomas shows his tail and begins to doubt who Jesus said he was. So now they're discouraged, they're depressed, they're, they're disappointed. Welcome to the American church of the 21st century where it just feels like and seems like God's just nowhere around anymore. And all we are, amen, is just pork chop for a rock bar. <laughs> Hello, guys. The truth is, everything is in God's own timing, not yours or mine. Amen. So you don't have a right to be bitter and upset with God because he didn't do what you thought he was going to do or what you expected him to do yes. through prayer. Yes. We must learn to not be dominant with God, but rather submissive to yes. God. We have no right to be dominant to him. Yes. Listen to me. Submissive to God. Submissive to his will, his way, his perfect plan for our lives. Submissive, amen, doesn't mean you're a mindless, you're a mindless robot. It means submission doesn't mean you're a mindless robot. Amen. The reality it is submission simply means you submit to the mission. Okay. Yeah. Right. Submission means submit to the mission. Submission doesn't mean you're weak or that you're frail. It means that you've got a mission that is more important than you. More important than your feelings. More important than your ideas. More
More important than your prayer requests. More important than your wants and your desires. You see, if you keep going through life without a mission that's more important than you, then you'll always remain narcissistic. Here we go. Find out who loves me after this comment. As long as you remain narcissistic, you will always weigh the value of God based on the impact on you. It's quiet tonight. I know what you want. You want me to run around, scream, holler, shout, and get back to my jail story. The truth of the fact of it is, as long as you remain narcissistic, you will always weigh the value of God, His will, based on the impact on you. Because your goal in life is how you feel. Not his will. It's how you feel. What kind of impact is this going to have on me? God esteems nothing above his purpose. His goal is his mission. His ideas. His plan for your life. Only what God has purposed will come to pass. Not your wants. Not your requests. Not your demands. Hey man, you throw your hand on your hip. Throw your head side to side all day long. Only his purpose will come to pass. I said God esteems nothing above his purpose. All things work together for good to them who love God. But it don't stop there. There's a comma, not a period. To them who are the called according to His purpose. So until you live God's purpose above your agenda, you are never going to see the hand of God move in your life the way it really needs to move because you have become a self-enthroned egoist. A self-enthroned egoist means this. Your ego is so out of control that you have actually crowned yourself, your wants, and your desires above the will of the King of Kings. Amen. And so often we become self-enthroned egoists, narcissistic, arrogant. Are you living out God's mission? If not, no wonder you're not happy. No wonder you're not at peace. Can I tell you, amen, it's, it's, it's purpose versus preference. And your preference does not take priority over God's purpose. Let me say that again. You, you need to come to the altar tonight and get this rearranged, amen, and get your priorities out of line. Your preference is not priority over God's purpose. Amen. I got a son-in-law right now headed in prison. Not a son-in-law, brother-in-law. I got a brother-in-law right now, my wife's brother, Nathan. And Nathan's been in and out of trouble, in and out of trouble on meth, on drugs, $45,000 in child support. He, won't, he needs to pay. He won't pay a dime of it. Hey, man, he's stealing. He goes and steals copper. He broke into a man's shop the other day. The man held him with a foot on his neck, held him at gunpoint. Hey, man, he, he done bought all of his teeth off of eBay. It's not funny, man. I'm talking about a blue-eyed, black-haired, good-looking boy. Good-looking boy. <laughs> When Pop died, his daddy, Pop, called him Pop, my father-in-law. When Pop died of pancreatic cancer, Pop left him back on an entire business, a diesel truck, a backhoe, and, and 30 years of, of, of construction business lined up where he goes in and digs footings and pours concrete and rebar into it. Hey, Amen. He gets to the house, the foundation ready to come and build on. Hey, Amen. Left him 30 years, and what did Nathan do? Smoked it all away, dumped it all away, till eventually mom had to sell the backhoe, sell the truck, sell the diesel, sell all the stuff. Nathan go ballistic, man. Now he's become a habitual hoarder. He's still bringing in 45 to 50 VCRs. Who wants a VCR? VCR is so out of date. But he'll bring them piled up. Why? It's junk. There's no value in it. <coughs> Somebody paid you to take it. It just steals all the time. He's been in and out of jail for years. He's become street smart, street savvy. He knows how to navigate. Even in jail, he knows how to write letters to judges and get paper. It's crazy, man. But it caught up with him. The other day he left. He's a convicted felon. He's supposed to have any guns. Not supposed to be around any drugs. He left, went down to the store to get some gas. The state probate officer pulled up in the yard, got out of the car, walked up there. I'd just been up there two days prior to that to help Nathan do some, with his welding, to do some welding on the back of my trailer there. I knew he needed the money. I thought, well, I'll give him 100 bucks just because I ain't got time to fool him. Walked up the trailer, whole yard smelled like skunk weed. Had plants growing inside the travel trailer. 
And he opened up the door and he just knocked you down. I said, Nate, man, you got to get that skunk out of that lemon trailer. I said, that's, this, this, man, you can't be doing this. And then he was mocking, making fun and laughing about it. I said, well, what are you going to charge me to do this? He said, well, he said, I thank you for coming to Nate's fabrication where the prices are high and so am I. <laughs> where the prices are high and so am I. Duke could well, really went, stoned out of his mind. I don't know, I guess he was entertained by the bead. I don't know. Anyway, two days later, probate pulls up. Walks right up there and opens right up. Walks in there. Six loaded guns. Bags of meth. Money laying there. Pot plants. Hooked him up. Took him off. He's gone now. This will move him to Kilby Prison. He's scared to death to go to prison. Now he's calling every night. Well, when I get out of here, I'm going to do this. When I get out of here, I'm going to church. When I get out of here... Mom's up there wringing her hands the other day. I said, don't you fret one bit. You're scared of him. You don't even let him sleep in the house. You make him sleep up there in his truck inside that bar because you wouldn't even let him come in the house. Matter of fact, Mom, you're so fearful of him, you cook food for him and you set it outside the door and shut the door. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to feed your child outside the door and lock the door because you're afraid to let him in the house? This, this is the world. I said, don't you sit there and wring your hands. That's the best thing for him. Amen. Because he gets out, he goes in jail, he stays for th th 30 days, he detoxes while he's in there, he comes out, he's got a level head, everything's right, he's doing everything right, he runs right back with those dogs, gets another case of the fleas, amen, he's right back where he started again. I said, he needs to go off for a while because he's lost his gratefulness for the freedom, he's lost his gratefulness, amen, for his mama, he's come up here and jumped up through a yard, he's tormented the whole living family, amen, everybody's scared of him, I'm ready to fist fight him. I beg you, Brother Dad, I'll give you $50 to come up here. We'll whoop your butt in this house right because I ain't got a mama no more. My mama's laying out in the graveyard six foot under right now. And the only mama I got left is my mother-in-law. And while I'm here, you ain't going to talk to her like that. I'll give you $50 to come up here. I'll whoop you up on this yard. Then I'm going to fly to my bill and preach my revival. <laughs> Welcome to my family. Amen. Hello. He knew not to come up here. I mean, the reality was, amen, is, is that it's, it's where he needs to be. Mom's so caught up in the scourge, amen, because God didn't do what, what she wanted him to do. She didn't want to see him go to what I mean, you listen to me, guys. Amen. It's God's got a purpose and God's got a timing, amen. And, and let me tell you something. Mom's preference doesn't take priority over God's purpose. And if it is, there's a big difference between jail and hell. I'd much rather go to jail than go to hell. And the road he's on right now is about a foot and a half from going to hell. He needs to go to prison. He needs to go to jail. Not because we want retribution or to be ugly. We want him to get his life right. Get his head screwed off. Get his GED. Come out and have a purpose for me. Yeah. I'm preaching tonight. Some of you ain't liking this, but I don't care. It's truth. The truth is, are you living out God's mission? If not, no wonder you're not happy. No wonder you're not at peace. Because his peace is only found in his mission. And doing what you were created to do and being faithful to your assignment. And that is pleasing an audience of just one. And that one is him, not you. I'm not getting on to nobody tonight, but I'm trying to tear down that stinking thinking mentality that we have. The torments us all night long because our whole world, and we won't admit it, and half the time we don't even see it. Right. Really, our world revolves around no one with us. Sometimes somebody has to just bust us. You can't be that way. Amen. Church, we have to trust God enough to allow Him to be God in our lives. Yes, God. I've been asking Him and asking Him to bring my babies back home. Caleb won't go to church. He promised me when that baby was born. Caleb's a good boy. He ain't a drinker, he ain't a smoker. He ain't out running around with women. Never has really been into women. Matter of fact, they don't even like it when Lexi wears makeup. He don't want her out looking all hot and bothered. Why don't you just feel country boy? Put your hair up a ponytail, amen. Put your flip flops on. Let's go town together. You seen into all of that. I'm glad. He didn't take after his dad. <laughs> amen. Hey, I just, he just ain't into that. And then you got Abigail. And Abigail's going through stuff in her life right now at 20 years old. And she's trying to navigate through. And I just want him to get in church and love Jesus. And I've been asking God for so long, God, get my babies back in church. You know what God told me? 
He said, I can do it a lot easier when you shut up and get out of the way. Amen. It's the truth. And then my rebuttal to that is, well, that ain't easy. Amen. God looked at me and said, exactly. Exactly. I'm your father and you're theirs. And the problem you're having with them is what I'm having with you. You don't want to listen either. You want to take control of everything. You want to tell them what they can do. They're grown. Leave them alone. If you shut up and get out of the way, yeah. quit inviting them to every revival you have that's three miles of their driveway. Quit telling them what kind of church starts, amen, and say it in such a tone where they know you mean business. Leave them alone. Quit calling them every day, trying to figure out what's... Leave them alone. The other day, when him and Lex was having a fight, you had to stick your... It ain't none of your business. You're an in-law now. You're on the outside. they got to navigate their way. they got to make it work on their own. And I said back then, well, he ain't romantic enough. <laughs> Shut up, Eric. Maybe you. <laughs> I mean, I raised Mindy putting little sticky notes all over the house and the kids watching it. And I get ready to leave town. And three days before I leave, I start sending love letters back home. And so that the first day I fly out, there's a love letter in the mailbox. Next day, a love letter. And Wendy gets love letters all the way through. And, I get, and then I deliver the last one. Hey, I'm going to get off the plane. I put those sticky notes all over the house. And I put them on the toilet seat. She raises it up. Woo, I'm back. <laughs> Take a little sticky notes. Stick one in the shower. Nothing big eyeballs. Well, hey, man, hello. Just, just, just send her roses, send her chocolate, write her love letters by hand. Amen. I, I've always been that way. I take her to town. The other day she was hurt, laid her down on the bed. I massage her feet with lotion. Amen. She massage her neck. Amen. Brush her hair. Always pet her. Always touch her. Got my arm around her. I'm infatuated with my wife. Amen. She ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> and then you got Caleb and Lexi. Said it cracker barrel and it's on the phones. <laughs> and I told Wendy that I said, I'm bothered by the fact, man, they just, it just, where's the romance? And Wendy said, You know how that woman give you the eye? The way that's translated is, shut up. <laughs> ain't none of your business. What are you going to do? Give them counsel on how to be romantic and one of them? They're going to listen to you, your daddy. Leave it alone. It's not easy. I get disappointed. I get discouraged. I want it now. I want my son back up on the platform and playing that guitar, amen, watching him and his mama sing together. I want Abby standing by the piano with me singing Oceans. I want that back. Now they're grown. Thank God. Are you living out God's mission? If not, no wonder you're not happy. Because his peace is only found in his mission. Church, we have to trust God enough to allow him to be God in our lives yeah. and in our family. It's not easy. Joe said, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. Yeah. That phrase, yet while I trust him, means you're a Bible student, not the Bible scholar. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's a good yeah. word right there. Yeah. I'm the Bible student. I'm not the Bible scholar. Right. He don't have to trust me. i got to trust him, Sister Brenda. As I land this plane of clothes tonight, it means that you never graduate. You're always learning more and more about God. And you trust Him even when the floods rise and the fire is hot and things are not going like you wish they would. Man, I don't know who has need this message tonight. I feel like there's so many of you wrestling with me in this. I'm not mad at nobody. This ain't been real easy to preach. Unless I crack jokes and get you laughing, I feel like we're losing traction tonight. Some of you are pushing back on this. You're resisting this. You... You don't want to hear this tonight. I know it's not quill. I know it tastes like crap, but you've got to get this down to you, baby. It'll lower the temperature. It'll lower the fever. You'll sleep better tonight. You've got to receive this. This is the Word of God. I'm not out of the Bible. I'm just going against the grains of where you've been at mentally for so long, and I'm trying my best to pull you across. When things don't look good, things don't feel good, and your emotions have turned, amen, 100% against you, it means I will still praise Him. I will still worship Him. I will still magnify His holy name. When your mouth is dry, your heart is broken, and you don't feel like praising God or even coming to church, you still drag yourself in here and stand with reverence and shout it out anyways. I'll bless the Lord at all times, and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her most in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. You gotta do that not on the mountaintop. Sometimes you gotta do that in the valley. 
Do you not know by now what drives that devil crazy? Because that devil says, I know he's not going to praise God now. There ain't no way in the world, amen, she's going to be excited now. Just got diagnosed with a terrible doctor report. Now fears in belly. Ain't going to sleep good tonight. Lost his job after 17 years. House just burned to the ground. Just buried her loved one. Widowed now. The house is empty. Totally silent. Another family just walked out the back door and quit the church for the bell. Joe Biden, another four years. Oh, my God. Oh, I know they ain't got no praise in their mouth now. Not under these circumstances. But there's some folks in this room. Hey, I said there's some folks in this room. That have learned that no matter what state they're in, they're going to praise God anyway. going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to keep on singing. I'm going to keep on tripping. I'm going to keep on dancing. I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on being faithful. I'm going to keep on being committed. I'm going to be content no matter what state I'm in. You're one of those people. Take about 10 seconds, amen, and give God a stupid praise in this place. Come on, man. Play with this text just a bit. We're gonna to go to the house. I got orange juice and Sprite to pick up at the dollar store in a minute. <laughs> so in our opening text, Andy, in this story, they're talking about Jesus, and the stranger in their midst just interjects himself. The best is for last. Here we go, guys. I got two pages left. I've already went through 15, so this is gonna be in real quick. He was not invited. He was not noticed. He was not called upon. He just interjects himself into their conversation. Listen to this. The thing I like about God is he's often aggressive. That God is aggressive enough to intervene in your understanding of who he is. Because Eric, we all see through a glass darkly. And we don't know everything there is to know about God. Even though we are legitimately disciples as they were, we still don't know everything there is to know about God. Right. And they are sharing with each other information based on their limited understanding of God. And Jesus asked them, what y'all talking about? Hey, what's up guys? What y'all talking about? What's on your mind today? And they said unto him, not recognizing who he was, well, sir, have you not heard what happened three days ago? And Jesus says, no, what's going on? Your God is an actor. He feigns not to know. He allows you to get down on your knees and talk for two hours about something he already knows. He lets you feel like you are informing him about a situation that you think he don't know anything about. Uh, that's good, man. Uh, Isn't that cool? I'm there for my God. I'm here to take you in the name of Jesus. God sitting up there saying, well, okay. <laughs> pour it out. Yeah. Tell me all about it. Yeah. He allows you to get on your knees and talk for two hours about something he already knows. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Lord, I've got back pain. You know, Lord, my bills are due. You know, Lord, I'm lonely. God, you know what happened to my son? My kids are lost, God. My husband's back slid. I just lost my job, Lord. Joe Biden running for a second term, God. Do you know that? Which one of those things do you think God doesn't already know? You see, sometimes God will hide himself and allow you to walk in your own wisdom. So you'll eventually discover a little further down the road that your wisdom is foolishness in comparison to his intellect, knowledge, and his understanding. And God does that because sometimes we are not fully convinced that God's wisdom is right until our own wisdom has failed and left us in utter defeat. Isn't it true that too often we fail to listen to God first because we want to do it our way or do something, amen. You have to, and so sometimes, amen, you have to bump your head in order to get humble enough to find your knees. Yeah. 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 I said, sometimes you have to just not, God, let's go ahead and let you bump your head real good. Bam! So you can eventually find your knees. In closing tonight, it's not always easy trusting God, amen. His purpose, or His timing. It's not always easy trusting his counsel, nor is it easy trusting his advice, much less his work. Well, one thing I've learned thus far, 30 years of preaching, 51 years of living, 
He's always right. Yes, sir. And his timing is perfection. All right. Right. Even when I don't feel it, like it or agree with it, it's perfect. And it needs absolutely no adjustments. Amen. There's 52 weeks in a year. I flew to Africa. I preached the national conference for the entire nation of Zambia. One of the greatest highlights of my life. Thousands and thousands of that. I gave an altar call for first time salvations. Went to the back of the altar call line. It was a half a mile long. I was there for 10 days to get a phone call. As I was walking up on the steps to preach. But they found my mother in a hallway, 56 years of age, dead of a massive heart attack. Her and daddy had been married for 38 years. I'm the only biological child of them together. I've got two older brothers. They're my stepbrothers, but they're my brothers. Amen. They were two in one when mom and dad got married. Mom's first marriage, it was a drunk, it was very abusive. So abusive, went to the hospital. She gave birth to my older brother, had an episiotomy. He came home, tore the stitches to please no one but himself. Very mean, ugly, aggressive, tormented, drunk. Beat my mom. Dad came along. Being real man. Gave her a life. Amen. The only marriage my dad's ever known. It was his sweetheart. And I was so upset with God right out of the gate. You gotta be kidding me, God. There were 51 other weeks you could have took my mother when I would have been home. Where I could have prayed for her before they embalmed her and gave her some kind of hope that I could have brought her back. Come on, guys. I know it's morbid. But that's people deal with things different ways. And, and I'm just believing God. But now when I get home, she's going to be embalmed hard as a blooming brick and land in a box. And, 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 and really, God, I'm 9,000 miles away. You had 51 other weeks. You could. I don't like God's timing sometimes. And I sure don't sometimes understand His purpose. It took me 42 hours to get home on the phone, listen to my dad scream like a man who man had lost his blooming mind. And I walked into the funeral parlor, and there lay my mother up there against the wall, and all I could see was this part of her face sticking out of the box. And I walked up there. I walked up and I looked into that thing, and I reached down to touch her just to see if it was real. It was so real. The body was so cold and hard. And everybody's looking at me, being the only preacher in the family. And I had so many mixed emotions going on, so wild in my mind, and I thought, what am I going to do? And I remember I stepped back from the coffin and I looked up to the heavens. I didn't fake it. God gave me the strength to do it. I lifted both my hands in the air and I said, God, I don't understand your timing. And sometimes your purpose makes no sense to me whatsoever. But I know your plan is perfect and it needs absolutely no adjustments. God's grace came on me standing at that coffin. I turned around and preached my mother's funeral. And standing by my mama's casket. I had a fat, slim brother sitting right there on the front row who had just enough Jesus he can't enjoy sin and just enough sin he couldn't enjoy Jesus. Lost without God. Mama had talked and talked and talked about what's it going to take for Robert to get his tail back in church and get to serve the Lord. And, and I reached over there and I come out of the pulpit and looked my brother right dead in the eyes on the front row. Matter of fact, he turned us around. I was standing about right here and he was sitting right about there. And I said, Robert... I said, get a good long look at Mama's face. And I shoved those roses in the foot, unscrewed that box, reached over and lifted that lid. We weren't supposed to open the coffin anymore. And my brother looked at Mama's face, and I looked down at Mama's face. And I said, get a good long look at her face right now, brother. And, and, he, and he's hollered out, why? I said, because if you don't repent and get right with God, bam, that's the last time you'll ever see it. I said, the hook gave an altar call, 38 people. We ain't supposed to swear, but in the strongest terms possible besides swearing. I'll tell you the truth. 38 people come running out of their blooming seats, fell at the foot of my mama's casket, gave their life to Jesus Christ, had a head-on collision with God in the middle of that funeral. Amen. Before we even took that seed, planted it in the ground, it was already producing fruit. And the first one to fall on the altar was my brother. I'm telling you right now, for the Holy Ghost in this house, brother, sometimes you don't understand his timing. Sometimes you don't understand his purpose. Sometimes. sums it all up, doesn't it, church? Yes. The Bible says, trust the Lord with all thine heart, lean not in thy own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. 
As I said at the beginning of this message, as I land this plane, I'll remind you in closing. I come to not just wonder if there's anybody in this house who claims to be his own. Are you really his own? Because if you are, then I can assure you that he will show himself alive to you very soon. Don't give up just yet. He'll show himself alive to you. Don't throw in the towel just yet. He'll show himself alive to you. Don't cave into defeat and misery. He'll show himself alive to you. Don't listen to the devil who tells you that you're finished and there's no hope. If you belong to him, amen, he'll show himself alive to you. Trust the Lord's timing. Trust God's purpose. Trust his word. Never seek to become the scholar. Always stay the student. Don't get arrogant by ordering the Lord, amen, that when he doesn't do what you thought he should do, you allow discouragement, disappointment, woman to envelop you. Always remember it is He that made you and not you yourself. God is faithful. God is in control of your destiny. And He and only He knows how to get you there. He's not in the business of abandoning His own. Failures or not. My closing verse tonight is this. God knoweth the way I take. And when He had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said the ending of a thing is much better than the beginning. Folks, God is not a God that he should fail any of us. He's faithful all the way to the end. Trust his timing. Trust his word. Stay in his will. And you shall come forth as fine gold. Amen. What a word. What a word. Trust God. I love you, church, and I don't want nobody walking out here tonight running on low voltage and having to go home and give the devil another 24 hours of your mind and your emotions. It's a beautiful day today. Yeah. Beautiful day today. It's been a good day. Route 21 is going out of business, closing all 150 stores. That's where I get my cologne at. $15 a bottle. Don't give me a headache. Man, when he likes it. And they're going out of business. And it shut our store down in Alabama, but I knew they had one in Elkhart. Uh -huh. Brother Bell and I got the truck today. I'm glad I trusted his timing. <laughs> we went to me down the Route 21. We got out and walked in there, and everything was pretty much gone, wasn't it, Brother Bell? There was no cologne in there except some perfume for women. And I was, I'll be honest with you, I was like, oh, man. Man, I've been looking forward to buying like 10 bottles of this stuff. Just have it shipped home. Store some of it up. Walked up to the counter and I said, sweetheart, do you not have any, 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 any of that particular cologne? It's called Rue for him. She said, no, honey, we're, we're out. All we have is perfume. She said, are you talking about this kind? Reached underneath the table, pulled out. It was a tester bottle. Tester. I said, that's exactly it. I said, you got any more of that? And she said, well. She said, no, we don't. Everything we've got has already been sold. She said, uh, hold on just a second. Went there into the back and brought Eight bottles out. They were all testers and full. I said, I said, can I pay for that? She said, no, honey, we can't sell this. You ain't got a barcode on it. It's free of charge. Take it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome, man. I got on eBay and found another guy on there that sold me like 20 bottles a day for $7 a bottle. Brand new bottles. Shipping it out tomorrow. Free shipping. It's been a good day. Got a new pair of shoes. <laughs> they had a house full tonight. Amen. His presence has been real, man. What a day. Amen. And I'm not so naive to understand him, man. There's a devil waiting. Yes, that's right. That's right. There's a devil waiting. Mm -hmm. right. Greater is he that lives within me. Right. He that's within the world. Amen. My last statement to you. The Bible says God neither sleeps nor does he slumber. So I want everybody to go home and go to bed tonight. There ain't no need both of you staying awake. <laughs> Stand with me tonight. I'm done. I'm thankful tonight, amen, for his presence in this room. Him being faithful, amen, to come by, amen, and just love on us tonight. Give us all a faith lift. Anybody feel like they're leaving tonight with a little better faith lift? I love you, Veronica. I'm well aware of the situation. And 
hope this ministry to you in our sweet mother. Don't be discouraged. It'll be okay. Veronica's not the only one. There's others in this room tonight that are fighting battles. Situations that have seemed so overwhelming. Circumstances that have seemed to not let go. And I'm not talking about your little dog getting killed. I'm talking about serious issues. Isn't it refreshing when he just takes time out of Jupiter and Mars and planets and solar systems and numbering hairs on our head and keeping up with every out of word spoken that he would just take time to stop by a little city called Montville walk in here tonight and talk to us.
highways and the hedges and come, tell them to come in that your house might be filled. So let's just invite somebody tomorrow night, call them on the phone, and just invite them to the revival tomorrow night. Okay? God bless you for coming. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. What I say unto what? What I say unto what? What I say unto all. What I say unto all. Watch. Watch. Watch.